It's tax time, and the RLS boys are fielding lots of questions about how to avoid paying more than is legally necessary. Some strategies reduce your taxes right now, but others can achieve even greater lifetime tax reduction. Today, Adrian opens the show explaining one such strategy known as asset location. Next, Roshan helps you recognize and avoid a growing tax-related ripoff, phone and email scams purporting to be from the IRS designed to con you and your loved ones into giving them both your information and your cash. Finally, Eric outlines a little-known but massive tax deferral opportunity for some small business owners, namely defined benefit plans. Some older owners can defer as much as $300,000 a year. Stay tuned as we discuss all this and more right now on the Retirement Lifestyle Show. Welcome to the Retirement Lifestyle Show. I'm your co-host, Roshan Langani, here as always with Adrian Nicholson and Eric Olson. We've got a great topic for you today that's very, uh, very timely. Before we dive into that, I want to ask, gentlemen, did you watch the basketball this weekend? Who, did you watch the NCAA tournament? No, not Eric? more than about five minutes, my friends. I, sorry, it's, it's like, what's wrong with me? I should, that's like a part <laughs> that's all, of Americana. That's, good, that's part of American malehood, and I'm just skipping it. What's wrong with me? I enjoyed uh, watching a lot of the games over the weekend. Uh, some of my friends and I went to uh, U Street. Are you familiar with that area in D.C.? And mm-hmm. we went there, and we watched a couple games, and it was a lot of fun. A really good weekend. And then uh, Sunday, I went golfing. First time I went golfing since it's been about like a year. So it's been a while and I played really well. So I really had a very sports filled weekend. So that was a a lot of fun. How about you, Roshan? That's great. No, I enjoyed it too. Actually, this, uh, the first two days, Thursday and Friday of the tournament might be my favorite sports uh, event, sporting event of the year when you get four games on at the same time, staggering the ending so you can get watch. Uh, uh, and the, the, the college kids, man, they play real hard. So it was a lot, a lot of fun. I also, I went to, to Atlantic City for some of the games and I realized that uh, uh, in between I played poker and I'm not as good a poker player as I thought I was. <laughs> so, so, Did you come out I'm ahead or behind? Gambler. Uh, I came out ahead on the basketball games, behind on the poker. <laughs> Not huge either way. I'm not a big, not a big gambler, but it was, it was, it was fun nonetheless. And I'm looking forward to, uh, to this weekend's game. But as I said, it's a, a little bit of a letdown with the excitement of four games at a time. And then you now mm. have to deal with just one at a time again, back to normal. Mm. One thing I did note was the historic last season of Coach K at Duke. Yes. And the props that uh, Tom Izzo from Michigan State gave to, to him, just talking about him the, as the greatest of all time and uh, just to, Coach K's humility and responding to that, receiving that. Glad he didn't call me some other animal, is I think his response <laughs> as opposed to the goat. So uh, yeah. it, just wonderful to see those kinds of career stories playing themselves out as well. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm a Maryland guy, went to Maryland, so I hate Duke. Oh, but okay. um, <laughs> after, after, uh, after um, you know, when Jimmy V gave a speech after he passed away and hearing about how much Coach K was there for him, mm-hmm. uh, he makes it hard to hate him mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> when you hear stories about him being a nice guy. But uh, at least while he's on the court, I find a way to still do it. <laughs> But gentlemen, let's let's dive into the topic today. Very, very timely uh, topic today where we're going to talk about tax tips. We've all, uh, all three of us, uh, Adrian, Eric, and myself, we've gathered some some thoughts and ideas for you on, on taxes. And uh, Adrian, why don't you uh, kick us off? Yeah, I'd be happy to kick us off with this exciting topic. Because like uh, Roshan mentioned, this time of year, taxes is pretty much on everybody's mind so finding ways to just be more efficient and just strategies that you can use just to have a better after tax consequence or just lowering that tax bill can be uh, very useful so i'm going to kick us off with my topic today in taxes which is asset location i think this is a big one when it comes to being more tax efficient 
So the biggest thing about asset location, there's two really important things that I found out that you really need to consider when it comes to placing a certain asset in a type of account. And that is your investing time horizon and your tax bracket. I think those are two very important areas. So just giving you a little bit of background on what asset location is, if you're not familiar with it, this is where you determine which assets should be in a tax deferred account and which should be in a taxable account. I'm going to leave the tax exempt off to the side and I'll bring that back later. But for you that are not familiar with a tax deferred account, this is a 401k and an IRA. And when I talk about a taxable account, this is just an individual brokerage account, all areas where you can uh, place your securities or your assets in. And again, this asset location is extremely important because this is a way for you to maximize your after-tax returns on investments. And again, the two important things that you should really consider when it comes to asset location is again, your investing time horizon and your tax bracket. Because let's just say in theory, bonds can generate a lot of taxable income. So it would make sense to keep bonds in a tax diverted tax deferred account. However, in many cases, if you have a long time before you retired, it would make sense to keep stocks instead of bonds. It would make sense to keep stocks in the tax deferred accounts rather than bonds. It would make sense to keep stocks in your tax deferred account and bonds in your taxable accounts. Because if you're investing long enough, the higher total returns of stocks over time can generate a greater tax burden than bond, the income from bonds. Do you guys have a quick comment on this before I move to the next point on this? I love this topic, Adrian. I didn't know you were going to do this. By the way, for our listeners, we didn't tell each other in advance what it was that we were going to come bring with our tips. And so I'm hearing this for the first time. I love this topic. Um, and I think you made a really good point, a really interesting point there about having to think about the um, impact of the, the tax consequence of owning stocks. And so the instances, I, I think I'm hearing you saying that there are instances in which you may say simply because of the a number of taxable distributions they generate in the form of either qualified dividends or ordinary dividends, that they actually may be less tax efficient for some taxpayers than having taxable bonds would be in, in a taxable account. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's, that's exactly my point. I just wanted to break it down just simply, you just have stocks and bonds and a tax deferred account and a taxable account. But let's mm -hmm. just say you're just not a fan of bonds right now, given the current interest rate environment and you have concerns around inflation, so you own all stocks. So mm -hmm. this is where the tax exempt account, the Roth IRA can be super effective because you're allowed tax-free withdrawals in the future, which will be a good place to keep stocks that you plan on holding for a very long time in this type of account. And if you have stocks that you plan on just holding, holding for a shorter period of time, this is where you'll look at keeping them in the tax deferred account. And then lastly, the taxable account. Yeah, I think this is a really good, a good tip to use um, at, at all times when you're building your portfolio and planning. So similar to what Eric said, I completely agree with you, Adrian, that yeah, tax efficiency is, is huge. Um, you'd mentioned time frame and time horizon. That's, a, that's definitely an important one, even when you're just selecting, selecting your investments. But um, I think the comparison you gave were, were owning stocks in a tax deferred or tax-free account. Um, as our listeners may or may not know, if you own a stock and you hold it long term for a in a taxable account, you will pay long term capital gains, which is a better rate typically uh, than uh, ordinary income tax, where uh, which you which you would pay if you were to have um, take it out of an IRA. But as Adrian said, if you've got a long time frame, it may make sense to defer those gains and deal with the higher tax when you withdraw because those gains might be so great. That'd be an interesting, um, uh, interesting calculation to compare, looking at timeframes and uh, assumed rates of returns for that. Uh, either way, I think the point stands that you've really got to compare the two and look at your overall portfolio. And um, as you said, where you locate the assets within the portfolio. Yep. And just ov overall, just planning in this area is extremely important. Again, kind of, you're trying to 
as assume and predict your tax bracket when you're going to be taking this these withdrawals so just planning this out is going to be extremely important to see what when it comes to strategically placing these assets in these accounts are, are really important especially if you're dealing with a number of different securities a number of different stocks and bonds it can it can really cause you to really look at your overall plan and really be as precise as possible to really be as efficient when it comes to your taxes. Yeah, so guys, uh, just I want to comment that one of the tools that um, I know you use and I use uh, frequently is Income Solver. And uh, we're not here to sell software, but this is just at least one of the tools that, uh, that I use that I think is really effective in this particular category. And uh, when I do this on you know, client after client after client, what I find is, is that the tax location um, opportunity can oftentimes move the, f the final value of their portfolio at the end of, let's say, a 30 or 40 year investment horizon to, until, the, let's say, it's a married couple, till the second one passes away. A lot of times that will be, I'm just sort of ballparking it seven or eight percent greater through correct tax location. Sometimes as much as twenty-five percent more left in the portfolio through the use of good tax location versus really the 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 worst choice. And what's interesting is that it's not uniform from one client to the next which approach is uh, is optimal. So just as you said, it really isn't just a hey, here's a rule everybody adopt it. It is something that you would do on on a case-by-case -case basis to analyze because as you pointed out there's so many things that are at very that vary in from one client to the next what for example is the size in relationship to their other buckets of the of the tax deferred bucket the tax free bucket and the taxable bucket they're not everybody's going to have the same number of 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 their or same percentage of their portfolio in all of those. Not everyone is going to be drawing on those with an equally uh, with an equal pace of drawdown. Not everyone's going to be in the same tax bracket. So I just would say, folks, uh, listeners, I really want to strongly encourage you to make sure that your advisor is going through this with you. And if your advisor doesn't have those tools, seek us out. We have these tools. We're we're adept at using these tools. We use these tools all the time, and we'd love to help you get answers on it. But a great topic. Adrian. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like you said, just sometimes people do rely on just certain rules or thumb or common practices when it comes to their their overall plan, where there are some instances where you really do have to run through the numbers as great as it might not be sometimes and time consuming it may be. At the end of the day, this is something that you really want to get right. If you really want to just be super tax efficient. If taxes are a burden sometimes or just an area that you just really don't want to deal with and just want to be as effective as possible, you really have to run through the numbers in this in this scenario and not just rely on certain rules or thumb or whatever your neighbor is telling you works best for them. Yeah, I, um, Eric, you mentioned this software. Uh, what I find most interesting about it is I feel like I've been doing this long enough where there are many instances where we we can guess the outcome with a lot mm -hmm. of a lot of these different tools. One of the reasons I ended up getting this uh, software is uh, is I was surprised frequently enough where I thought it was definitely worth it. And I'm the uh, second most frugal person I know next to Eric, so if he's <laughs> if he's gonna spring forward and he, he says it's worthwhile. That's that's enough of uh, an endorsement for me as well. Um, so. Adrian, anything to add on the asset re, uh, location strategies or any other tips that you have? I guess what I would say to the listener right now, if you just heard what I just talked about and you just said, wow, Adrian, now I just realized all my assets are in the wrong account. Should I just switch them over? I just recommend that's, again, where you just need to have a conversation where if you just start switching over to accounts and selling and doing all this, you might just create a bigger tax burden for yourself. So again, this is what we mentioned. This is where you really just have to look at the numbers and this might be a multi-year process to get this result. But again, this is just something you should constantly be aware of sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, more, more than likely, if you do need to make a major change, it will be multi-year, uh, as you said, Adrian. Yeah, excellent. Great, wonderful topic. I, I'm gonna jump I'm into going last. what I've got. Yep, yep, I'm gonna jump right, jump right into what I've got today. A little bit of a d different direction. Uh, with the uh, tax tips, but uh, 
I've seen multiple things about how uh, tax scams are on the rise. Mm. So looking into protecting yourself from some of the uh, tax scams that are out there. Uh, so I'm going to inform you about a, a few of them and just give you some uh, tips and ideas on how to make sure you're not a victim. The first is if you're getting a refund, there are a lot of tax refund scams out there. So uh, there's a, an article that we'll, that we'll share from Trend Micro, but they had said they found that in the first three months of 2022, there were little under 136,000 fake websites uh, where they'll send you text messages or emails to file your taxes and claim your refund. You click on it, they make it look like it's a like it's the IRS site. They ask you for your personal information, including your social security number, and then they will use that information for a variety of things, some of them as uh, simple as filing a tax return for you to claim a refund that you're due, uh, you know, taking that identity information to, for identity theft. The second one that's pretty big out there right now is their stimulus payment scams where they're telling you, hey, we're, you're owed another stimulus check from the IRS. Mm -hmm. Click on this and they will once again ask you for information and then they will use that information for risks of identity theft. The third one that's, that's out there that's pretty big right now is you'll get robocalls. And this has been out there for years. I know I, I've gotten these. I've had uh, friends and family that have said they've gotten it, and they'll claim they're the IRS calling you, and uh, there's a problem with your tax filing. Then you give them all your personal information so they can fix it, uh, so they can either A, give you a refund for your account, or B, they'll say you actually owe money. They'll start threatening you with jail, uh, jail time, and then they'll say, but you have to pay it with a gift card or a wire transfer. So I see, Eric, I see you smiling uh, as, I, as I say this. Are you smiling because you're aware that the IRS will never ask for gift cards and wires? <laughs> I am aware of that. And they're, one of my favorite YouTube channels actually is this one guy who, who uh, scams the scammers who are asking for gift cards uh, to pay the Social Security <laughs> amounts that are owed. Yeah, it, it, it's crazy how they're able to find your information, phone number, just to, to reach out to you and get, and yeah, the, like I, I've heard many people say this, I've thought myself, but if uh, the scammers could use their ingenuity for good instead of evil, they'd probably be very <laughs> successful in a legitimate, legitimate space. Um, just a few, a few tips here for those that have, uh, where you've been contacted by some of these people, or if you will. The first is um, the IRS won't call you. Uh, they'll notify you by mail uh, at the very least first if they call uh, at all, but it's, it's, it's not a frequent thing for them to call you. Second, they're probably not going to ask you for personal information. They're the IRS. They have it already, right? So if, if they're actually the IRS and they're calling you, they know who you are, so they don't need your personal information. Um, what Eric, well, Eric started laughing, I thought it was about the gift card, but that's another thing. The IRS will not ask you for a pre prepaid card, a gift card, or a wire transfer. If you actually owe money to the IRS, you can pay it right on their uh, website. Um, next, the IRS won't stop you from questioning what you owe. So if you get a call like this and they're not willing to discuss it with you, they're probably a, a uh, scam artist because the IRS will have all the information. And finally, the IRS will not threaten to call the police on you if, they're, if, you, if you owe money. So these are just some, some red, uh, red flags that if you hear it from these, these scammers, please don't share your personal information with them. Uh, and uh, as I said, you can always call the IRS directly if you if you are fearful that it's a legitimate call. You can say, "Hey, I'll call you back." Go to the IRS website. You'll probably be in for a long hold if you go that route. But better to deal with a long hold than months and months of untangling identity theft. Yeah, I have to believe too. During this 
like time of year where people are filing their taxes, where people are looking for tax efficient strategies. Just, this is just a big topic right now that these calls are probably more prominent right now than let's just say like during like the holiday times or during like the fall where they they really try and scammers really try to uh, they adapt and they try and see what areas they can really affect people and what time i think is really important so that if you de definitely get a, if you get a call like roshan says now do get us get a third party opinion ask call ask to call back another time and just look up all these like strategies that they're they're using now because again these scammers are really smart and they really try to make their scam tailored as specifically as possible to either you or what is something that's going on to this day i think is really important to make note of yes definitely yeah. be careful be careful this reminds me of a, a show i'm the fan of the uh the office when uh, michael scott says when a Nigerian, uh, when the Prince of Nigeria contacts you directly, you don't ask questions. You help where you can. Do the opposite. <laughs> ask, <laughs> ask questions. Ask a lot of questions, yeah. <laughs> yes. Ask questions. Go to the website. Find the 800 number. Call them directly. I and think I've everyone, got to make sure whatever. you go to the, the, the correct website, too, because that's yes. also an important thing. I think if you go to the IRS website, there's always like a lock or there's something like official. Just make sure like the links that you click on, just make sure it's correct. You're on like the right area, too, because they can maybe make a link look really official. But if you click on it, it, it might not be. So that's really important to make sure if you, if you do your research online that you're on something that's official. Yeah, and the official site is irs.gov. So if you if you uh, make sure it looks official, as Adrian said, because uh, as I mentioned earlier as well, these scammers are uh, they're good at scamming. So you want to make sure you go to irs.gov, the actual official uh, official site, and then you can look for a local office to contact them. They have a help button uh, right now, and I'm actually looking up the phone number that you can that you can call so give me a moment i'll see if i oh here it is the official phone number off the irs website it says they're open from 7 a.m to 7 p.m for individuals it's 800-829-1040 once again 800-829-1040 the 1040 is like the 1040 uh like the tax form so we will share the uh, the IRS website as well as the phone number as well in the in the show notes. So we've pulled it for you from the actual official site. But as I said, you can go there yourself and get the information. Great. All right. Did we cover what you wanted to cover there, Roshan? Yes, we did. Okay. All right. And so, folks, if you are wondering, what is Roshan talking about with Michael Scott and the Nigerian Prince, then you just need to Google Nigerian Prince scam, and then you'll find out what the, you'll have the backdrop for all of that. So, guys, I don't know. Are you get you getting questions from time to time with people saying, "I'm just getting killed by taxes. How do I? How? What can I do? How can you help me uh, slash my taxes?" Do you get that question from time to time? Yes, we do. And usually, who are the ones that are asking that? Uh, I mean, usually it's clients with with income and assets, so they are legitimately at a high uh, high tax bracket, and they are getting killed killed by taxes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. Well, so uh, the uh, there's uh, lately I have been getting this question from a number of I'll say thirty, forty something um, high income um, prospective clients that are saying, "Hey, I don't need help with anything except somehow." solving my tax bill. And so I thought, well, I'm going to go ahead and share a few ideas that for, for a certain segment of our audience may be the, the ticket that you need to kind of unlock the door to really significant tax savings. Before I give that kind of intro, though, I do want to mention, just as an aside, we're having this conversation in late March. And so we have, by the time you hear this, episode it'll be the end of march and so you'll have about two weeks left if you're hearing this right away to take action 
uh, whether or not you're from this limited subset of people I'm going to be speaking to or about in just a moment, but if, if you have uh, an opportunity to make contributions to, it's too late to make contributions to a workplace-based plan like a 401k or a 403b or 457 if you're an employee, but you still have an opportunity if you qualify, and there are income tests for this, to make contributions to a traditional IRA. And as you can do that through April 15th, and, uh, or to a Roth IRA, you can do that through April 15th. Again, there are income limitations and tests, and, and you need to know what those are to see if there, any contributions would be deductible or not. But if you haven't already made your contributions for 2021, like I said, you can do that through April 15th, subject to these limitations. So just know that. And if you're uh, self-employed, even if you're not if if you're not necessarily just crushing it right now with just all kinds of crazy amounts of income, but you still can make contributions to what's known as a SEP IRA, if that's the the vehicle savings workplace based vehicle that you're using to save for retirement. You can make contributions to a SEP IRA as late as you file your taxes, even if you you file for the extension and that carries you on your personal tax return all the way out to October 15th. You could still make 2021 contributions. And those, depending on how much you're, you're making, those could be cons- fairly significant contributions as well. So, but the, the device that I wanted to talk about today is one that isn't talked about a lot. And this, but this makes a great tool. This this approach that I'm about to describe is a great tool if let's say you are in a really highly paid occupation of some kind, or as a, your business is really uh, generating really strong revenues year after year. Especially if you're a, you're a solo player, and you don't, in other words, you don't have employees, or if you do have employees then the number of employees that you have is relatively small and they are more on an administrative level. So, so businesses, let's just restate this, businesses that have a pretty high ratio of the very highly compensated professional staff to the um, less highly compensated, compensated um, administrative staff and operational staff, the sort of tool that I'm about to describe is one that you might be able to find tremendous benefit from. And that is to use what's known as a defined benefit retirement plan. Now, let me, why did I emphasize the word benefit? Because all the other sorts of plans that we've been talking about until this, or at least that I've been mentioning, are what we call defined contribution plans. You have a defined contribution to a 401k and your employer matches that contribution or your employer may make contributions, defined contributions to the profit sharing portion of your plan. You make a defined contribution to an IRA or to a Roth IRA. But the other variation on this, which is authorized by the Department of Labor in the same statutory framework that permits these other sorts of approaches as well, um, is known as a defined benefit plan. So what's the difference? Well, in the case of the defined benefit plan, in its conventional form it's it's essentially what we're talking about here is a pension a, a company pension plan and in this case you can contribute enough by a formula and I'll get into the formula in just a second what it allows but you can contribute enough based on your age your earnings and your life expectancy to provide a certain um, predefined amount that would be paid to you on a monthly basis once you finally retired. Well, if you're getting started late on this and there isn't a lot in the plan, then you can well imagine you can super fund that defined benefit plan in order to, to accomplish that outcome of a certain monthly payment that you would receive once you retire. Now, there's a, I'm going to talk about the formula again in just a bit, but I want to mention one other spin on this because what I just described, this defined benefit pension, the traditional form, can sometimes get you into a, a pickle. It can get you into a pickle because the plan each year has to be subjected to 
uh, an annuity uh, or um, you have to have an actuarial review to determine whether or not the assets in the plan are sufficient to accomplish that stipulated dollar amount that each of the participants in the plan would receive. And if, let's say, it's been a bad year in the markets, or you, other, for other factors, maybe just had a really bad investment choice in there or something else, then it's, then it's on the employer, in this case, to shore up that shortfall and bring the plan back into health. And on top of that, if let's say you've had just the opposite, you've had a really good year, and the assets in the plan are now, uh, after the actuarial examination, are ahead of schedule, now, the, by the same token, you're not able to put in as much into the plan to, to keep it in alignment with its eventual target. And by the way, that is, when we're talking about massive tax savings, this is the name of the game, right? Is getting money into the plan because every contribution that you make into this plan, you as the employer or the self-employed person, all of that's coming straight off of your taxes. So. Uh, there's, a, there's a variation on this theme known as the cash balance pension plan, where it's the same principle of, of super funding it, especially if you're older and more highly compensated. But in this case, it's not the, the, in, it's not the requirement that you, for certain, generate a certain monthly income upon retirement. Instead, what you're doing is just seeing that the growth of that account, that cash balance account, is keeping pace with two elements. One is the pace at which it's, it, it, you're contributing to it as a percentage of each participant's salary. And the other is an interest rate on the prior year's amounts. So there it's a much easier thing if things get a little bit out of balance to kind of bring things back into health. And there's not this, this sort of perpetual burden to ensure that the plan always will have enough assets to satisfy those monthly um, payments for all the participants all for the rest of their lives. This plan allows you, if, if you're, let's say, 50 or 55 or even 60, to say, I'm going to just set up the plan, run it for years let's say then i'll retire and then we'll shut down the plan and and you'll have accomplished the goal of having deferred a lot of money into the plan and then reach those account balance levels that you needed and then let's say you close your company you sell your company you close down the pan plan mission accomplished you deferred a lot how much is a lot well let's just it's in relative terms but just note that if you are instead saying i'm just going to do this with a 401k deferral, contributions only. Right now, if you're, let's say, 50 or older, you could do $27,000 a year. If you then augmented that with profit sharing amounts and employer matches, you could bring that into, I believe it's this year going to be 60, 67. I might be a little off. It might be 64 and a half. I need to go back and check my numbers. Still a lot of money. But if, on the other hand, 60 years old, and you're now starting to fund this plan or you're in the midst of funding this cash balance plan, you could, to meet the actuarial um, targets, and by the way, this is just a rough estimate, contribute more than $300,000 into the plan that year just for yourself and then to satisfy the requirements under the Department of Labor for your other employees you would make a contribution that ranges, I'm going to say, somewhere in the neighborhood of, it could be a little bit outside, above, or below this, but somewhere in the neighborhood of, let's say, 5 to 10, 4 to 8%, something like that, of each other participant's um, salary that year. Can you imagine that? Let's say that you, you're a, a set of, uh, let's say, do, uh, attorneys, or you're a set of, you're a set of doctors, or you're you know, one or another, you're an architect or you're in sales or something like this and you have, you're in technology and you have very dependable revenues year after year like this and, and usually pretty high. Being able to defer, let's say, 100000 150000 dollars $200,000, $300,000 into this plan could do a major, major work in dramatically reducing your tax load that year. And then 10 years later or whatever it is, when you finally... Uh, 
close the plan down. Now you have this giant pool of tax deferred assets and you can decide what you want to do with them there. So for, for those, again, for those of our listeners who are saying, I'm getting killed by taxes, what can I do? If you're a business owner, this is a phenomenal way, uh, especially if you have really steady revenues. It, it doesn't work as well if you have year-to-year big variations in how much is flowing in. But if you have fairly steady and very high revenues, this can be a fantastic solution. There's a little bit more administration. You have to do the actuarial work each year, but it's not, it's not outrageously expensive. And if this is an idea that appeals to you, reach out to us because we have the connections and we have the, the ability to, to help you set this plan up and achieve precisely those sorts of massive tax uh, deductions. Yeah, the tax deductions will massively outweigh the initial uh, or additional administrative uh, uh, time and costs, Eric, as you just mentioned. So, mm-hmm. yeah, great opportunity. I, I, I just want to do a really quick recap. One is Eric mentioned the um, IRA contributions you can potentially still make traditional or Roth based on income levels. Uh, next, he talked about the difference between the defined benefit plan, which is where you determine the benefit first and then you contribute to reach that benefit, which typically is greater amounts you can defer than a defined contribution plan, which is like the 401k plan. And he gave the numbers in there. The maximum with full profit share for 401k is in the 60,000 a year neighborhood versus the maximum for a defined benefit plan being the 300,000 neighborhood. Uh, Eric, are there any other organizations or groups you can think of where the defined benefit work? Typically, I've seen it for small businesses, as you mentioned, professionals, where you have usually a big uh, difference in income. So usually the the higher earning professional makes a lot more than the lower earning administrative staff. You also typically have a big age gap as well, where you'll have those professionals be in their 50s and sometimes the administrative staff are in their 20s and 30s. It, you, that's a good point. You mentioned the age difference because it is the part of the formula for how much you can contribute per person is a byproduct of their age and hence their life expectancy as well as their years to prospectively being able to start collecting on that so as a result it, it, the formula permits much smaller contributions for younger people in because the assumption is that you'd still then be on pace to amass enough for the for the final outcome of that cash balance to be achieved exactly so great opportunities for deferral adrian uh had mentioned where you put your assets I mentioned avoiding tax scams, and Eric talked about uh, putting assets away through uh, defined benefit plans. Gentlemen, any other last-minute tax tips or ideas that you have? Not today, but I think we could do another show. We could do, I mean, every <laughs> Let's quarter do a we series, do Eric. Tax <laughs> tips. Yeah. Oh, I'd love a series. Let's do a series. Fantastic. The joke I is mean, I would love to, to do talk. a series for every topic we ever discuss. <laughs> That's right. So, <laughs> so, uh, next, next week's topic is going to be non-qualified deferred compensation plans. <laughs> there, there we go. Now, to all of our listeners, thank you for joining us again. We hope you found this as helpful, uh, actionable things you can do for your taxes, whether it's this year or planning for next year. It's definitely never too early to start planning for your, uh, for your taxes. Uh, This has been another episode of the Retirement Lifestyle Show. Please like, subscribe, give us five stars. Visit the website to see some older episodes. The website is retirementlifestyleshow.com. And we'll be back next week with another action-packed episode.